Deanna Troy needs a real chocolate sundae when she talks with her mom. The Federation would like to negotiate a trade agreement in which they could acquire Caledonia's rich deposits of Trillium-323. And who needs rational when your toes curl up? Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 3, Episode 8, The Price written by Hannah Louise Shear, directed by Robert Shearer. Uh, this was November 11th, 1989. Where were you? We have a very special guest today. It is Hannah Louise Shearer. What a coincidence. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing just fine. Thanks very much. Very good. Uh, uh, welcome. Wait, it was 1989? November 11th, 1980. Oh, I thought it was later than that. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is super exciting. We cannot wait to dive into this episode with you. You've written a bunch of episodes. You've been a big part of our show so far. We've been talking about you a ton. It's so yeah. great to have you finally here. Do you want to point out everybody very quickly please go to creationentertainment.com. That's creationent.com. Check out Trek Tour, Trek to San Francisco, March 8th through 10th. There are dozens of Star Trek celebrities there, including Sirach Lofton. Uh, yes, I will sir. be one of the main hosts of the show. It's going to be so much fun. We're going to have a seventh rule panel. There's going to be all your favorite celebrities, and we cannot wait to go. Get your tickets and your hotel at creationent.com. Once again, that's March 8th through 10th. All right, let's get into this. Yeah. So, Hannah, where did this idea come from? Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to go back into my memory because uh, I was approached by Mike Pillar, I wasn't on the show at the time. So Mike approached me with um, Rick Berman, uh, who had fired me earlier, saying that they wanted a, <laughs> yeah, they wanted me to come up with some ideas. And I think at the time I felt that Deanna wasn't really being utilized enough, that she, you know, that there was a lot more that you could tell about her story. So I pitched the idea of her falling in love and um, with somebody who was turned out, would turn out not to be so good and Riker would be jealous. So, you know, they thought that was kind of interesting. And at that time, I think, I don't know, it felt like there were 20 people on staff. I know that's not the case. But when you're a freelance writer and you walk into a room with an executive producer and the staff, it can be pretty intimidating. So they all had ideas, however many there were people in the room. As I said, 20, 25, it was probably six. So <laughs> <laughs> they all had ideas of how this should go. And I, I remember getting into an argument, I don't remember with whom, and we were going back and forth really quite a bit about this. And Mike Pillar was on the sidelines and he was going, this, this is fantastic. Put this in the script this argument so it was huh. really interesting experience and i if i remember correctly because you know it, it's a long time ago it's like 30 years yep. or something um if i remember the argument was about deanna reading this guy's mind or you know hearing what he was feeling knowing and not mm -hmm. telling him that she knew that she was a beta. So um, that's what the argument was about. And, and I said that sucks in a relationship. You can't, you know, that that makes her, and, and seeing as how he was, turned out to be a bad guy who also had the same abilities, um, that's what made it kind of kind of interesting that, that she had no compunction about reading him. Mm -hmm. um, because it's what she did automatically without telling him. 
So it was, uh, to me, it was a very interesting concept. It wasn't as much as the, the love story, um, which I, I wished had been um, deeper in the end. But um, it was nice to see her. I, I remember that. Well, it's really tough to have a a deep love connection in 43 minutes. Very. Yeah. Very. Which is something we've said before while we watch these episodes. Uh, Ryan is, you know, famous for saying it's hard to believe somebody falling in love in one episode. And I thought that you did a great job uh, addressing that in the dialogue um, when uh troy says is it possible to fall in love in one day and <laughs> she's talking with uh dr crusher about you know the feeling she's having and that helped me as the audience yeah. believe the one day falling in love more because it's very unlikely but you acknowledge that in the dialogue i thought that was great the um you know, people feel like they fall in love all the time. I mean, there there are immediate attractions and whatever we want to call it, it's there. I mean, it's a normal human reaction, even though she's only half human, um, to to have instant reactions, emotional reactions to people. So that doesn't bother me as much. I mean, you know, as you as you grow up in this world, you find yourself becoming intensely attracted and just, you can do it in a few minutes too. So, and, uh, and I think it, it happens a lot. So, um, but I'm glad you weren't bothered by it. That's, yeah, you know. you know, it really hit me hard how quickly the, the, the guy just walks right in, he starts playing with her hair and she's okay with it. So I was like, okay, one of two things. They have a past or there's something about this guy that we don't know yet, you know, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm like, there's got to be something. It, it, this is not a normal interaction. It's got, And then you did eventually reveal that he's one quarter beta zoid and that he's empathic. And that's where that connection came from. So that way. A lot of us that are kind of, you know, like I'm kind of a fussy duddy. So I'm sitting there going like, what's I don't get it. You know, it allows me to relax and say, OK, I get it now and I can go along with this story. How important was it for you to incorporate that, you know, that element in the story? Was there something where it wasn't originally like that? And then you added that he was a beta zoid? No, no, case? no, no. Um... Really underlying, when you think about it, they were both hiding something from each other. They were hiding who they really were. And on some level, they both knew it, you know, because not, and not just because they had, you know, they were half and quarter betazoid, but because on some level, some emotional level, we know these things. We, we, yes. we know. And I, I know that's, Difficult. It starts with that look, by the way. I've I've been in that position too. It it's that look and that first look that they when they locked eyes, there was a magnetism there. It was unspoken. It. But we've all had that. I mean, that's how you yeah. eventually get into the relationship that you get into because that magnetism you recognize. Uh, and sometimes it's like this, handle, you know, and sometimes it's like this, but it's still a magnetism. Yes. So um, that happens too. It 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 just it depends. I felt it. I felt it. What she looked over and she and she looks at this guy and of course he's handsome and he has the 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 blue eyes and you know he's the piercing look. So all of those things work towards his favor, but still the chemistry was there and then that's what you highlighted in the in the script. That's what was performed. I think well. Um. Yes. He was not my favorite. <laughs> okay. um, especially, I mean, think about it. Jonathan uh, Frakes is a very strong character, and you know, very magnetic. And the mm -hmm. two of them always were very, uh, um, you know, they they had an intimacy based on past 
on their past relationship. And also they knew each other and they were very fond of each other. So it had to be something that was different than that. Something that was so intrinsic to each of them that, um, that it would feel stronger in the moment than the past relationship she had had, which was standing right next to her, basically. That's mm -hmm. not easy to do. And then he brings it up too. I thought that was interesting when he comes up and he says, what about Commander Riker? And and he, he goes right to that hot button of emotion that she has, you know, that this suppressed kind of uh, this undertone of chemistry between her and Riker. And he goes right for that. And I'm thinking, boy, you're about to mess this thing up. The last thing you do is bring up another guy when you're trying to do your thing. <laughs> Actually, but, it just shows how well he knows her. Yes. As yes. quickly as that happened. So yes. he knew what he was doing. You know, he, uh, um, whether that was a trick of his mind or um, it, it was probably a combination. And it's been a long time, but it was probably a combination of that, of his abilities as well as his emotional attraction to her. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Did he, uh, did, was he inspired by that character? Uh, was he inspired by somebody that you had seen in real life? Because a lot of times will pull from something or someone, you know, or you'll say, you know, you watch this guy and you're like, boy, does that actually work? I guess it did. And then you're like, maybe I can incorporate that into this story. Or did, was this just. Okay. Then, you know, this was a driven? long time ago. So I don't remember that aspect of it, but I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, so much of it is based um, on her because she's the one we care about. She's the character we know. So what you have to do is build the opposite to her in whatever way or what you know is going to, that she is going to respond to the character that you know. Um, I don't think so. I think he was basically, you know, a, a creation of the moment that would uh, that that would be good for her. That would that would suit part of her story, you know, part of her personal growth forward. So, mm -hmm. no. You, you referenced also <clears throat> this kind of poker uh, in this episode. You know, the Riker says, "Is that a game?" You know, po poker. What are you talking about? I don't. You know, I know oh. nothing about it. Um, wasn't he that, lying? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah he was lying. Yeah. And, and <laughs> he was, that was a I'm sorry, back. he was yeah. bluffing. He bluffing. was bluffing. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. But it was a callback to another episode that people, the fans love, which is the when when everybody's playing poker together and that on the table. Um, and so I thought that was a clever thing to to bring the poker reference back up again this many episodes later. It shows a little. It shows continuity for me. Um, the, the the other thing I wanted to ask you though was the concept of the wormhole and a stable wormhole eventually becomes the basis of Deep Space Nine, and I can't help but watch it and think, well, wait a minute, is this did they find the wormhole that Deep Space Nine was talking about or is centered around? And it almost seems like you, you created Deep Space Nine or one of the <laughs> fundamental themes of it in this episode. Is that? Which I have not gotten a dime, just so you know. <laughs> uh, okay. Yet. Okay. Yet. There's, uh, Yet. No. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> or ever. But uh, what's really interesting to me about the wormhole part is that was nowhere in the first draft. It was an entirely different story set on the planet that they were um, near. And they were going for the rights. It was mining rights for some kind of very rare, it, look, it's a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was set you know, deep underground and it was a fight over mining rights, basically. 
And uh, when when I finished the first draft, uh, Mike Mike said this doesn't work. I mean, this aspect of the story. I mean, and he was dead on. He was right. He said, "Let's um, let's do something more spacey." I mean, <laughs> not those words, but yeah. let's you know. He said, "This could be anything. This could be any show. It could be any time." He said. Well, how, how about doing a, a wormhole that so it was really pillars idea not mine just so you know so they can okay pillars to stay. so but then i had to write an entirely different story in the second draft as to what it is and it not I'm not saying it wasn't difficult, but it's not as difficult as it sounds because what you're doing is you're replacing one catastrophe for another um, with different descriptions. Uh, the, the um, you know, what's at stake is the same. The And the wormhole was never the story. The, the, the whole, the thing was always Deanna's story. So uh, this was, it just wasn't as important as the emotional story. The, however, the wormhole I thought worked out really well. Mm -hmm. uh, I did too. Yeah, so, so I was very glad to have been able to do that a second time and, and make it a much better script um, with much higher stakes. Because the you know the first time around it it didn't play as well as as that so so I have to credit Mike Pillar for that that was absolutely his idea and uh, and then then we made it work. Yeah, there were a lot of really cool uh, like poker references, especially towards the end when Riker is speaking with Rawl. My favorite line of the episode, I think, is when Rawl says. You're much better than you realize. And Riker says, Oh, I hope I'm better than you realize. Yeah. I'm like, that is I, that yeah, is such yeah. a Riker. That is perfect. Yeah, it was really right. That. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And of course, you know, Jonathan Frakes just ate that line up for yeah. dinner. He yeah. just has it the, yeah. the gleam in his eyes, but I hope I'm better than you realize. I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, talk about somebody perfect for a role really and uh yeah he's a great guy so um uh, and actually i really like the line that you wrote uh, where it's, oh, it's also a riker line in which he you know rawls trying to one-up him and and bring out the fact that he's going to take troy away from him essentially he's won his girl over and i love what riker says to the to the effect of you know this is the first time I've seen you make a mistake because seeing Diana happy would be the greatest thing, would be a great joy for me. So if you could bring mm -hmm. happiness to her, that doesn't hurt me. I thought, brilliant. What a, no, that's what a lovely thing to say. And, and you know, and I, I, you know, I felt like he he meant it. I felt, I, I, I really felt that their relationship was so complex. And it had so many, so many levels to it. And, and I'm sure, and that continued throughout the series. Honestly, I, I don't know where they ended up. I don't, I mean, I, you know, I. I'm I married. Oh, did they? <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yes. Okay. Yes. I had a part in that. That's good. Yeah, yeah that. they ended up, they end up married there and they're together in the, the new series of Picard. Oh, good. So, yes. But yeah. um, he was always, to me, a man of great integrity, his character, um, and, and Jonathan as well. But his character was, you know, he's the stand-up hero. Uh, uh, Picard, I don't mean Picard wasn't a hero, but he, you know, he had his ups and downs. And he, even though he, he Picard, the, He's played so stoically for most of the time. You know, um, y you know that Riker is is the good guy. Uh, to mm -hmm. me, to me, he's the uh, getting the other script. One of the scripts I wrote was so difficult to give Picard any emotion because he didn't like to 
play a lot of emotion. You know, he he played it all very closed uh, in because, uh, you know, that's what the captain was. Not not uh, when you're the captain of a starship, you're not supposed to have a lot of emotion. And Riker, right. so Riker was the one who played all the emotion. Mm -hmm. That's you know, there's another element that I don't know if you created in Star Trek lore or added to it, but Star Trek fans know that Deanna Troy loves chocolate. That's her uh -huh. thing, and I don't think that we've seen that before this no. episode no so her talking about i want a real chocolate sundae yeah. star trek fans watch this scene and go i didn't know that <laughs> that's where it started because from there that I mean, is where even, it started well yeah all the way because, to like go ahead yeah no i love chocolate <laughs> who does <Yeah>. it? <laughs> okay. what I I, it's not just that i love chocolate it, it's it's a trope actually that women, especially when they're in love, involved, upset, broken up, you know, they gravitate toward chocolate. And I thought, mm -hmm. and it's not like I remember thinking this, but I'm feeling it now. So I'm sure that this is where it originated. Women depend on chocolate when they're emotionally um, at, at odds. So, mm -hmm. and I thought, why not? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what year this is, you know, you have, she's a woman first and foremost. So, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if, you know, you had chocolate? Mm -hmm. And it gives us all a little and, chuckle. Little chocolate. Well, for me, it set the tone, like you say, uh, it set the tone for me that she was not in a good place. Um, she was, she was feeling uneasy about some place in her life and, she wanted something to give her some stability, something that b b brings her back to a comfortable place in her life. And that's what she was looking for. That's why she was literally arguing with the computer. Like, no, I don't want that fake stuff. That, you know, give me a real one, you know, and because she wants that authentic feeling. And, and I guess of love, of comfort, of, you know, it's some kind of uh, emotional bliss, which this character provided for her in the exact right moment. I thought that was one of the clever tools. I don't remember. I I don't remember where she and, and Jonathan were in their relationship at this point. But yeah, it, it was uneasy. It was they weren't committed to each other. They were uh, they weren't committed to each other. And if you think about it, you know, being a woman without a family on a starship in the middle of nowhere, I mean, having adventures. And also she's she was um, supremely uh, sensitive. I mean, literally sensitive to other people's thoughts. And she had to restrain herself from hearing. I, I, I think the way they played it, um, I don't remember exactly, it was a long time ago, was that she couldn't hear the words, you know, but she definitely got the feelings. And this was something that had been, was debated in the first season uh, in the writer's room, uh, such as it was with um, Jean and <laughs> Maurice and, yeah, and the lawyer. Um, so- Yeah, Maze Lich. Yeah. Maislich, yeah. Leonard Maislich. Yeah. Leonard Maislich, yeah. yeah. I never had a problem with him, just so you know. Hmm. Never had a problem never. with him because, no, he was very good to me. He was very nice to me because he respected my father. Oh. Literally. Oh. So he was he was nice to me. Yeah, he knew my father. So my father was... Oh, he was a... Much nicer. He was a made guy, me. huh? Huh? <laughs> no, he was made guy. He wasn't okay. my main guy. But he, you know, he didn't treat me like crap, like he treated everybody else. So I got well, very good. happy with that. Yeah. That's so, good. Yeah. yeah. That's good to know. That well, was, uh, uh, because we haven't, we haven't heard anyone say good things. I know. That's, it's I'm definitely the first. Somebody. To, no, no, no. I have nothing good to say about him. <laughs> but nothing bad. But either. I have nothing bad to say about him because, okay. as I say, I, I was lucky. I was protected. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of which, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ciroc. I was going to change gears. No. Oh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't. I have to ask you about killing Tasha Yar. I just because we haven't had you oh. on, and 
I, I know you probably get oh. this all the time. It's yeah, we should have started with that. You're right. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but I, I have to bring it up. It, is it something that people always come to you about? Is it nobody is talks it... to me about it because most people don't know that I did it. So okay. um, there you go. We know. Uh, you know. <laughs> you know. It was. Uh, I have to say that was probably the hardest st- script I ever had to write. I, it was a rewrite. You know that. Yeah. It took me longer to rewrite that script than than any feature I have ever written. I won't say it took me as long as my book because nothing took as long as that. But <laughs> that was forever. Wow. But this was a brutal script. The original script had virtually no dialogue in it, um, which is why they never did anything with it. The fact that she wanted was that oily mud character in that original script, the 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 muddy Armus. Armus character. And the yes. only reason he's Armus is because the name I gave him apparently was another name for God that some crew <laughs> member objected to. So um, I named him Armus was... after okay. Bird Armus, who Right. We saw that there's somebody named <laughs> Armus. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah, it okay. was just easier. So um Oh, what happened? Here's the, uh, oh, oh. this is you and Denise <laughs> that was on the, at the strike, on huh? the picket at line. the writer strike. Yeah, yeah. on the picket line. Yeah. I killed Tasha Yar. Beware AMPTP. Yeah. This lady means oh, wow. business. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm very proud. Well, that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After all of these years, you guys finally reconnected in, in that moment. Yeah, she saw that. We're walking down and she saw the sign and she said, wait, wait, I'm Tasha Yar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was very, it was very cute. Um, That's amazing. Okay. So yeah. doing that script was kind of brutal. Uh, it, it took a lot of work. It really, it took a lot of work. Yeah. First of all, you're, you're killing off a main character. And you you want to give it the the weight that it deserves and the goodbye that it deserves. So um, it was hard. It was it was really really hard. I did a, a lot a lot of work on that on that. And finally, finally, it came together. And um, then <laughs> when I wrote the end, they never they did not change a word of my end, which I. Um, except we had a fight about um, a tear. That was it. Um, what's Who's his tear? name? Brent Spiner's tear. Oh, Data. Interesting. Data. I had him oh. have a tear, and they fought me on it, and they won, obviously, so that he didn't have a tear. So, I mean, I understood. I understood, but I thought it would be interesting. Uh, they went when they were shooting on the set. They the it was short, so they called me from the set and they said we're short. You you have to expand this. And I said where are you shooting? And they said we're on the bridge, so we need. A, I said okay. So I wrote the the first scene, the one with uh, Denise and uh, Worth about the bet in an hour or whatever, while they were calling me, I think they called me 20, 20 times from the set saying, where's the scene? I said, you're never fucking getting this scene if you don't stop calling. So anyway, so that was it. And she loved that. I remember we did the script reading it was the only script reading I was allowed to be in. Oh, what can I tell you? Interesting. Um, so, so yeah, so we were doing the script reading, and um, and Denise was reading the script, and she said, "If I had had scripts like this, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have quit." She, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so because that, you wrote, me, you never wrote forgot. her character very well, and you gave her things to say and do that made sense, and and it was like, well, this is how you use the character. It's almost like in yeah. this particular episode, the way you use. Counselor Troy, we've been saying this whole time, nobody knows how to write for Troy 
properly. There was a couple of instances here and there where her mm -hmm. skills were used properly when, you know, uh, um, Frakes was stuck on the planet and she was able to sense where he was and that he was going through difficulties. That, that was a good use of her skills certain times in the negotiation periods. But other than that, she's usually saying obvious things to people, right? Um, pointing out things that we just, anybody can with a set of eyes can, can, can understand. Like, yo, I think he's mad. Like, yeah, he's mad. He's just choking mm -hmm. the guy. Of course he's mad. But this time she actually kind of solved the puzzle for us uh, yes. at the end of the episode, which was great. Yes. Well, she had to redeem herself because she fell in love with a fraud even though he actually was in love with her. I believe that. Uh, I think so too. To, uh, to this day, but you know, he is, he was who he was. But he was in love with her um, for um, almost a selfish reason for, for what he, what she could do for him. Right. You could make Always. me, I think I wrote it down. He says, I need you. You could help me change. You could be my conscious. Like, that was deliberate, just so you know. Mm -hmm. that absolutely it's so interesting it's, let me just go a little farther off here listening to you guys talk about the dialogue i re i'm remembering it whereas i haven't you know thought about this script in a, in a very long time but I, I i i think it's a good sign that i actually remember the intent behind the words from something that's 30 years old. So, mm -hmm. so I, I just have to say thank you for bringing me back to that. I appreciate it. Well, thank because... you for writing dialogue that has <laughs> yeah. meaning behind it beyond just driving a story forward, right? You're yes. giving, uh, you're giving the characters a voice and a personality and depth. And you could tell that there's, there's deliberate intention behind it beyond again beyond just you know driving the story forward you're also uh examining the the human experience or the half beta zoid or quarter beta zoid experience and so these kind of things click with us a lot of times when when we hear something that works thank you to me that's what star trek is about i mean actually to me that's what all television is about it's it's about the human experience and how it is presented and then how people relate to it. And I want my work, whatever it is, whether it's the book or, or the soap operas that I did or any of it, if people don't relate to it, it's a waste of my time and my life. And so, you know, why bother really? Mm -hmm. The money's not uh, good enough. Oh, sorry. And speak <laughs> and speaking of <laughs> and speaking of relating, I, I thought that the the scene between Crusher and um, Troy, the, the that's in the backdrop behind Ryan, there, yes, it's famously I love known that more scene. for yeah, famously more known for the leotard action yeah. and the scratching than the dialogue. But I thought the dialogue was great because it was two characters confiding each other. Um, personal moment of you know kind of what should i do type thing you know like i i'm feeling this way and i i thought that was also another great um character building thing for both characters for them to be interacting and being like you know friends talking to each other thank you because i don't think we saw people interacting as people enough women certainly i mean these yes. women are up on a starship going through the universe and they will have friends. I have, I have friends. I have, my friends have gotten me through my life. Why would that be any different for Deanna or Beverly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, she's, she's got a kid. Beverly's got a kid. She, she lost her husband, whatever she was in love with. What's his name? So, uh, yeah. Picard. Yeah. And they, yes. need to, they need to be people, though. Yeah, they need to they still. They need to be people. Otherwise, why yes. are we watching? We don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. You know, right. at least I don't. And so. I think in the third season here, this is the first time we actually see the two of them having 
a conversation uh, between the yes. two of them that's not just like, oh, it, you know, three C's a heart to heart. Heart to heart. Yeah. A that heart was to very heart deliberate. Moment. And wait, didn't didn't Maurice get rid of her? The second se- when yes. was she yes. on yes. the show? Second yes. season she was yes. out. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they brought in the other Dr. Pulaski. Yeah. Right. Which which was she did a great job, but it was hard to make the transition. Was, yeah, the, it was. And well, for the audience too, like w- 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 all of a sudden one character's gone, yeah. another one's in. There's no, there's not Thank enough. Thank you, Maurice there Hurley. For he didn't. He hated her. <laughs> yeah. But I did like again the dialogue. You know, um, the who counsels the counselor line. I thought was very poignant because that was. That was what he was doing. He was counseling the counselor until she reversed it back on him. But in right. the beginning, he was doing the counseling like, oh, here we go again with here comes Counselor Troy. You're going to do one of your you know, diagnostics on me. And it was very neutralizing the way he was doing that it's, to her. Being a counselor has got to be a very lonely existence. Yeah. Because you're always there for other people and no one is there for you. Yeah. Totally. And this is the first time we saw the counselor's office, which is also, I think, a first so far. Uh, Ryan, you said it was going to come eventually. And, and now mm-hmm. we see Deanna in an office that, you know, of her in, own. And I thought, why anything. doesn't she have one? Yeah. Why doesn't anything. she have one? And she doesn't just yeah. hang it on the, you know. You can't just talk to her in a hallway. Like I want to, no. if, if I reserve no. time, I'll talk to the counselor. And she's not going to make house calls into, you right. know. Right. Everybody on the ship has probably got a roommate. So mm, what do you yeah. do? Think about That's it. That's funny. <laughs> exactly. Well, Hannah, that we have so much more to ask you about, but we're just about out of time here. I do want to point out, please tell us about Fortune's Son. Uh, ah. You did mention a book a minute ago, and yes, this is you. that book. Can you tell us about it? Um, here we go. I'm going to show it, but it's going to be reverse. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on this for like, a long time in in between um oh thank you in between gigs and jobs uh it was an idea i had when i oh my god when i was working on emergency and went up to seattle so the book is set in seattle i you know as i say it's only been the last few years and uh it's about a uh, a dad who's a cop whose son is kidnapped and it's about their relationship. And there's a little teeny, teeny, teeny bit of Star Trek in there in Ooh. that. Not really, yeah. but that the kid <laughs> has a gift. So there, you know, I can't seem to write anything where there's not something where there's something special about someone. So the kid okay. is slightly psychic. So um, I was very, very happy with the way it, it turned out. And it's a mystery and it's, it's a father-son relationship. And um, mm-hmm. I'd love- I love it. those. I love father-son relationships. Well, he do, he definitely does. That's, well, everybody, the, that's everybody, the heart of the book, basically. You can get this oh, yeah. book, everybody, uh, wherever books are found. We'll include a link or a couple links, uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble for everybody. You can just go right. in the description box below click on that link and uh, treat yourself. Yes. Hey, sometimes it's okay to buy yourself yeah. gifts, by the way, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and if you love uh, her writing, Han- Hannah has given us some great episodes when the boat breaks. Uh, I mean, just so many great episodes of Star Trek of television in general. I mean, we didn't even go back to some of my favorites like Knight Rider and MacGyver. <laughs> Uh, we'll, wow, we'll leave those for later. Oh my God, but, that is oh, going back. That is yeah. so good. <laughs> but but still, we love it, and, and it means that your you know your longevity shows that you have skills to me. And um, if you love uh, Hannah's writing, then I would definitely go out and get that Fortune Son uh, book because you put a lot of time, as you said, into it. it. Means there's a lot of heart and thought going into that book. Thank you. Yes. I think I think they'll enjoy it. And Everybody so, go check yeah. that out. And Hannah, yeah. this has been so much fun. We really appreciate you Thank taking you. the time and answering all of our yeah. questions for us. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Thank you for having me. It was it was fun. It was a pleasure. I appreciate it. You've been awesome. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you. Thank you. All right, everybody, stick around. Uh, we've got much more to uh, cover on this episode. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello. Let's get into these trivioids of the week. They go as follows. Deanna Troy checks her email. Uh, Counselor Troy needs a real chocolate sundae when she talks with her mom. The crew of the Enterprise is having a, an impromptu reception for the arriving delegates. The first and only stable wormhole known to exist opens every 233 minutes. The Ferengi enter the chat. A wormhole delivered a probe beyond the Denkiri arm. Federation decor is not Devanoni Rawls style. It must be Wednesday on the Enterprise, right, Deanna? Deanna is late for her stretch-a-thon with Beverly. Who needs rational when your toes curl up? The Federation would like to negotiate a trade agreement in which they could acquire Caledonia's rich deposits of Trillium 323. I don't know if that one's really interesting, but it's definitely it's pretty long, I tell a you that. sentence. <laughs> it's a long Caledonia. Trivia. Caledonia is a place. I believe it's it's like an island or island chain off of no that's it's New Caledonia off of Australia Northeast Australia um, Caledonia I'm not entirely sure what that is but obviously New Caledonia's got to be based off of that but that island chain's pretty rad anyway oh. there's a lot in this episode here. Oh yeah, there's a whole lot in this episode. You know, it's funny. I liked when they said. Um uh they had the idea the line was the proverbial lemon mm -hmm. and data's like sir it's like later data i love when data gets shut down on one of his like what does that mean kind of moments and they're like we don't have time to explain this to you data so it's later uh, that, that makes me laugh all the time they can't do enough of those corny little data jokes for oh me. yeah you you make <laughs> you make an idiom you you mention an idiom or or you know a colloquialism and he's like sir yeah. I do not detect any leaks or whatever <laughs> yeah and uh, oh actually that was a Jordy line in first contact but anyway um, Caledonia <laughs> was what the Romans called Scotland most of the area that is modern day Scotland is Caledonia just looked that up did not okay. know that anyway oh that's good to know yeah. You know, there are a lot of Brits uh, that were yelling at their computer, you don't know what Caledonia is? Freaking Americans. <laughs> Piss me off. Yeah. Um, the makeup was kind of creative in this episode, too. They had a lot of aliens to make up, you know, the Caledonians, uh, the premier Bavani of Baza Barzan. <laughs> oh. She had this interesting, like... Let's mouth. talk about her, because... Yeah. She is not the only Barzan or Barzan in Star Trek. They finally, that was the only one, I think, for like 30 years. And then they created okay. a second one, Lieutenant yes. Non of yes. Discovery. It's not your imagination. That is the same alien, uh, Lieutenant Non, our good friend, played by Rachel Ancheril. Shout out yes. to her. It's been a great friend of the show. So that was where her character came from. Was was this one today's character. from this episode? Oh, okay. So we should have mentioned that. that to Hannah. That that's another another thing, thing that, that has been took. reprised thirty years later. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I thought that was creative. Just that whole they didn't explain what that apparatus was with non. I think they said it's a breathing device or something, but yeah. they never explained it in this particular episode. I just thought, well, you know, I don't know what that thing is. Um, for but it was cool yeah and there was um, also Leor of the caledonians that we were just yes. talking about the tall guy with the butt head i called him the he had <laughs> the a first butt head of too. many butt heads <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah and he was super tall can i ask you though when you saw this stretching scene when it first yeah, opened, like, were you like, oh my God, this is it. This It's kind of like all the it. things that we've discussed in the past, like Justice. Yeah. When that showed up, you're fine. Like, oh, this is the one. And then when yes. this thing showed up, like you recognize it immediately, right? You're like, here we go. Whatever. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. 
I right away I was like, wow, the famous leotard scene is what I wrote in my notes here. Um, yeah, it was all that it was hyped up to be. I'll tell you what, um, it, that's the the style of the time period, which is funny because it's a little bit it's a little bit dated. Like those outfits kind of remind me of uh, Jane Fonda, you know, <laughs> the workout video stuff. Um, yeah. it was so not uh, as futuristic as you would expect a workout, you know, outfit to be. It just it seems like with the thong backs and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it, it, and the pretty, color too, like the what is that? Yeah, grayish purple with pink, and this is like copper with forest green or bronze with. I'm just like I don't even yeah. know what's happening anymore. And plus, and the and the cut, ah oh, man, I'm glad I wasn't in that scene. What I did like about the frightening in the sh the shot, we, Robert Shear, we we didn't ask if that was that that has no relations to to uh, Hannah Shear, right? No. That, okay, just. But I wanted to add, uh, say that I mean, the shot I, I, had that in. I could be wrong, but I believe it's spelled differently. Spelled differently. I think that's what I checked. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hers okay. is with an A and his is with two E's. Okay. Um, but no, the the infinity shot where you have the kind of infinity mirror effect. I thought that's cool. Uh, you know, you can't see the camera. Obviously, they're angled off to the side, so you couldn't see them. But I just like the shot. I think that's that was a cool thing. I also like the set that they're in. It looked like a place you would stretch out yoga, kind of the contemporary yoga studio type thing yeah, on the ship. That's true. It's tiny. It's tiny though. Look at. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then it makes you think it's... like you got to have a specific camera angle to not have the camera in the reflection yes. of those million mirrors. You kind of got to yes. angle it this way and then have the mirrors going down. That's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So it's not an easy thing to do, but you know, and, and the set looks great. Um, just the outfits themselves were a little bit dated, but they look great in the outfits. The both of them, obviously, you know, they, they, they look beautiful. Uh, but I couldn't believe that I was like, this is the episode. This, <laughs> this is what it's about. But the scene itself was good. You know, and the fact that they were talking about, you know, having a girl talk moment, you know, woman to woman, kind of heart to heart about their, their relationship, um, issues. So I thought that mm -hmm. was good. And Hannah, you know, captured that as as well as you can. So that that's why you kind of need a woman's touch writing for certain moments in these um, female characters on mm -hmm. the show. Now it makes a huge difference. Prediction: at least one person in the free for all will mention the Bechdel test, uh, which is uh, you know when a, an episode has a scene between two women or at least two women that are not talking about a man. So they're going to say that this scene does not pass the Bechdel test. And, you know, a lot of television at the time was very guilty of this. We've gotten a lot better about that, but they will bring that up. So it was nice to hear that because I noticed it right away, you know, which is good that we notice these things. But it was nice to hear Hannah's explanation from, you know, I was worried maybe she was going to say like, you know, yeah, I was forced to put in that scene. I didn't want to. But I thought it was really great that she said, yes. They're humans. They need to talk amongst themselves. They need to have. And so it was a great step in the right direction of, well, at least they're getting a freaking scene finally being humans and talking amongst themselves and kind of talking about the lighter side of the world. They're not talking about, you know, boosting the shields to 104 percent capacity or the latest medical developments or some emergency. They're like, hey, we're just hanging out. Troy's late. And she's late for good reason. You know, it just made him feel like way more human and way more, you know, approachable if that if that makes it or relatable, you know, so. It did. It did. I wanted Troy, though. There was a moment there as I was watching this that I was waiting for Troy to call out Rawls character, Divion Raw. I, I was expecting her to say to him at some point, are you using me as part of this negotiation? Am I part of this you know, your 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 negotiating tactics. Are you are you trying to get to me to, you know, somehow get to Riker or get to, you know, the Federation's perspective on things? 
I wanted her to call him out on that just so he could see how I wanted to see how he explained himself on that. Like, no, this is I genuinely care about you. I haven't met a Betazoid like myself that I feel this way type of way. Some kind of he had to verbalize that to me. I, I, I felt like she's too smart to be used as part of the ploy of negotiation. If she if, if it's a general you know what I mean? If it was genuine feelings, then she would have to know by asking him that question. To, to me, I felt like that was necessary. You know, that's a really good point because I kind of went through that range of thought process too. When I first started watching this, I'm like, who is this guy? You know, I told I already mentioned how I was like uppity about it. Like, what the I put so many WTFs in my notes. Like, <laughs> well, how is this working? Why is she falling for them? Do they know each other? Does he have a met like there? I knew there was going to be an explanation. And then I'm looking at this guy almost like, you know, like a predator, like, oh, this guy, you know, and and poor Deanna Troy is being preyed upon. And then I kind of started readjusting my thought process to like, well, wait a second. Why isn't Troy allowed to say, hey, I think this dude's good looking. I don't technically have any ties to anybody. I don't have to explain myself to anybody. Why can't she just say, this guy's hot. I'm going to hump him. It's Wednesday, whatever. Uh, why can't she do that without, you know, me automatically thinking, oh, she's she's falling prey to this guy. Maybe he fell prey to her, you know, <laughs> like, so I, I, thought, mean, I thought it was really cool. Yeah, that, because the other way around when Riker did it. Yeah, she yeah. wasn't ashamed of it. When she Riker was just like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because Riker has done the same thing without shame. And, and you know, we, we don't have any problem. With him. Yeah, we didn't think so, that he was falling prey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's like, oh, exactly. No. You He's like, I'll me. go do it, Captain. I'll <laughs> negotiate with her, Captain. Just give me a minute. Yeah, you know, she'll see like, the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I felt like it's okay for her to do it. I just felt like there was a need to question him. Like, yo, are you using totally. me as part of this negotiation? That's all I need to know. If 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 I'm part of it, then I don't. Then this is not as real as I feel it is. It's some mm -hmm. kind of you know, gamesmanship to, to get what you want. But if this is that we learned. Yeah. Last brinkmanship. Week. <laughs> exactly. And, and which I thought, which I thought it was when he brings it up to Riker, when he tells Riker, Hey, your girl, I'm, I'm taking her, I'm going to take her from you. That and was sinister. I thought, I thought he's doing that to once, you know, gain an upper hand in this, in this kind of mental chess that he's playing with Riker. So, all I wanted was uh, Deanna to say to him, are you using me as part of this negotiation or is this something? Now, that was clarified later at the end when he says, I asked you to run away with me and now I'm asking you again. So that gave me a little bit more like, OK, he was it was separate, you know, he was just but, mystified by her. Like yeah, he fell yeah. into her snare so hard that he was just like. Man, you could betray me on the bridge of your sh on your ship, and I still am asking you to come away with me. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't a betrayal, but I'm saying from his point of view, he's like, "You totally screwed me over." And she's like, "Well, that's my job, punk. What do you want?" <laughs> Who counsels the counsel of the counselor? <laughs> yeah, I'm lost. Well, hey, we only have a couple minutes left, so let's get up into the home run of the episode. What do you think, Sirak? Who gets the home run of the episode this week? Um, I'm going to give the, you know, I, I'm going to say I really liked uh, Riker in this episode. I thought he was pretty fantastic. Um, he wasn't over the top. He wasn't super defensive. He, he their relationship, the Troy Riker relationship, uh, has gained ground in this episode, even though it wasn't directly them, you know, being involved with each other. I feel like they they have evolved together as a couple. But um, having said that, I'm going to give that the episode to Marina Sirtis and Counselor Troy. She doesn't get as much focus on her character and development, and when she does have the opportunity. I think she does a great job of carrying the story. She she reserved herself when it was necessary. She 
her psychic abilities wasn't a hindrance or a help in this episode. It was, it was just enough for me. And I thought she played it right. She played it right. Um, and I just liked her performance in this episode. So I'm going to give it to uh, Counselor Troy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Definitely a Counselor Troy home run because, you know, she got to eat, eat her cake and eat it too. She got to have her personal life that she, you know, she had something enjoyable in her personal life. And she also succeeded in her professional life. And she also kind of resolved that or, or pieced that together in the line when she says something about uh, this may put me in a conflict of interest, which I hope I have now resolved. So she handled her personal life. Hey, that's her business, right? Do do your thing. She uh, it, it may have conflicted with her professional life, but she addressed it. She resolved it. And at the end, back to her personal life, the dude was still wanting more. So I'm like full circle. She triumphs all the way around and also secondary home run, of course, to Hannah Louise Shear for giving us yeah. this episode and giving us a lot of lines that I thought were really nice, you know, so I made sure to take some notes on those. So yeah. great stuff. Let's say thank you to some people named Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson, Bay out in Missouri, Titus Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, My Live from Tokyo, The Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manosphy, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, a.k.a. Grandpa One, and of course, Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got the free-for-all up next. Bechtel test, going to be mentioned four times. That's my prediction. We'll be right back on <laughs> The Seventh Rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule. This is The Free-for-All, and it's going to be fun. Melissa Longo has joined us. Hello. So has Jason Oaken. That's such a fun background. Uh, we've got my live in Tokyo with a Guinan listener shirt that she got from Melissa's walking art made by Melissa. You could find it at the introvertedrepublic.com. Whoa, same We're shirt. We're matching today. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Carrie Schwent is here matching nobody ever. What is that? <laughs> when do I ever? Yeah, I know, that's true. Uh, Allison Leach Hyde is here wearing a radical Shakar Salots shirt, almost ready for uh, spring training. Uh, Glenn Iverson is here finally. Welcome to the show, Glenn Iverson, all the way from the Las Vegas sector. You've got Tierney C. Diekman, aka the Borg Queen. Justin Weir's got his family shirt. That's the Cisco family, coolest family ever. And Chris McGee is the Dark Lord. He's got a seventh rule shirt also from Walking Art Made by Melissa. So got a lot of representation here today. Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Um, hmm. Hmm. I will say seven two. Seven two. Interesting. Does anybody else have any guesses as to what the IMDb score is that doesn't already know it, that is? 6.5. 6.9. Seven 7.6. Anybody else? All right. Everybody else has knowing looks on their Car face. Carrie says two. You got it at a two? Whoa. 6.2 or just two point in general? Two point in general. Carrie, yeah, believes, yeah. Carrie believes hey. that thousands of people that voted on IMDb <laughs> averaged, <laughs> averaged it out to a 2.0. That's a so bold, harsh. That is a bold guess. <laughs> there is a reason. That is a bold guess since <laughs> Shades of Grey was Carrie the Shaw. lowest rated episode, and that was a three point <laughs> something. <laughs> but wow. things may have changed in the last few weeks. This you never, is never true. know. This is All very right. true. <laughs> this is a. Uh, 
votes are in uh, yeah. on imdb uh the people that rated it averaged a 6.3 kind of rude oh, oh. i know oh. kind of rude everybody's like that's rude carrie's like getting there <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it wasn't guys, that bad. Did you guys catch the non-appearance mention? Yeah, Jack. Luwaxana uh, Troy. Luwaxana. Luwaxana Troy. Yeah. I got Luwaxana Troy. Was there a Jack too? Jack Crusher. Yeah, they talked about Jack Crusher in the scene. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Very nice. And they were stretching. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I missed the, some of the dialogue <laughs> there. Yeah, you didn't hear. <laughs> I was too busy writing way too many notes about it. <laughs> uh, okay. And also I caught one, some type of, or some sort of, it was Riker saying about poker. He says, is that a game of some sort? That's the one I got. There's a what second. You, what is it? And spoken by Dr. Crusher, when she's describing Mendoza's illness, she says, it's some kind of system-wide histaminic reaction. Right. Oh, yeah. That means allergies, right? Basically. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. So. Histamine, <laughs> right. yeah. Antihistamines. That's anyway. All right. Melissa Longo, can you please get us started on the right track? What do you think of this one? Out in Arizona, by the way. Out in Arizona. Um, <laughs> this episode was a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, there's a couple of things that I liked about it. Uh, I I like that it explores a different part of Troy that we don't usually get to see. Um, it, I, I like that it explores her sexuality, for lack of a better way to describe it. I like that it, it shows that women have appetites just as much as men do. And it was nice to see um, somebody else other than Riker get romantic with someone. Um, <laughs> I, it, that's a nice change of pace. I, I, I still feel like they're having a little bit of trouble writing for Troy and doing her character as much tr justice as she deserves. Um, but overall, but I, I, you know, it, this for me, this episode was kind of a breath of fresh air because I feel like there's a lot of heavy stuff going on out in the world, and and this was just nice, a nice break to just to say, oh, a romance. I enjoy watching romance, <laughs> even if the guy's a little bit creepy, and that scene where he. The, in Troy's office where he runs his fingers through her hair. And I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> so creepy. But um, <laughs> yeah, there was, it, oh, but there was some good moments too. So, <laughs> and that little shuttle pod, claustrophobic. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's kind of tiny. tiny. Thanks very much, Melissa Longo. Jason Oaken is here, who has never been claustrophobic, by the way. What do you think of this one? Well, I think describing it as a mixed bag is probably right. I can't say that, that I ever liked it. I think I've grown a little softer on it as, as the years went by. I was not looking forward to rewatching it again. I kept thinking, in my mind, I always think of it as a foot fetish episode because I can't get past that scene. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, to say that it's creepy, and that, by the way, that scene where uh, he runs his hands through her hair, even the script says, what the hell, right there. It's like, what the hell is happening? Uh, what? <laughs> That's what my notes said. <laughs> you know, so I guess they got this right when they were, when they were filming it. But you know, I don't know how well it went in the late 1980s. It's downright creepy these days. I mean, it's uh, it's down downright harassment. Uh, I think it's nice that they tried to write a romance for Troy. I think you know, frankly, it's a testament. I think to the actors that it came off like this on the page. It sounded awful. I mean, I'm amazed. You know, um, what Marina did and Matt McCoy did. I mean, I think the performance is a very good considering how it's. I'm not sure how it passed the page stage. I mean, it's just, it was cringeworthy just reading it. 
So again, it's a testament to the actors. I think, you know, the fact that we had a lot of scenes in the observation lounge tends to make things static. You can, you know, it's a lot of coverage. It probably took them a long time to film this with that much coverage. But uh, I, I, I probably think of this, or at least in my mind, it's probably one of my least favorite episodes of the third season, maybe of the entire run. I never enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, and just the way it is, there are a lot of things I can certainly say for later, but sometimes, you know, if you can't say anything good, maybe you shouldn't say anything at all. So you'll have nothing to say and things left unsead? <laughs> well, Stay tuned you know, to find out, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much, Jason M. Oaken. Mai is live in Tokyo. What's up, Mai? What'd you think of this one? Gosh, you guys all sound like me from last episode. Gee, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm happy Deanna focus happened. It's been way overdue and her appetites. The one I really focused on was the chocolate way to go. Chocoholics unite. Um, <laughs> it's, it's funny how she's telling her mother's voices, the computer to transfer the letters from her mother to the monitor. I thought that was <laughs> relatively amusing at the beginning. Uh, fashion point. I've always wondered why Beverly and Deanna wear their leotards backwards. I mean, yeah, obviously they want to advertise, but that was excessive. Um, <laughs> I I found out I finally figured out who Raw reminds me of. It's Ken Berry in Mayberry RFD. Absolutely, hundred percent right down the line. You guys ever watched Mayberry RFD? Andy Griffith show precursor. Uh, sorry, spinoff. Is look up Dink? Ken Berry and look up Mayberry RFD. It's oh my goodness, he looks exactly like him. I think it was um, Dingle's like, brother, that... right? I don't know. <laughs> could be, could be. I think uh, Dingle or Frank in one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the concept of telling someone you're an empath being ethical, absurd. It's akin to telling somebody you speak another language. I mean, in Japan, one of my main strengths as a negotiator for my company is being able to understand everything the opposing team is saying when conferring amongst themselves in Japanese. Now, I'm not about to tell them that I speak Japanese because I go into negotiations to win. In business, there's no way someone would give up an advantage in a negotiation. Never, ever. Or you're not in business. At the end, Rawl asks Diana, who he bizarrely calls Troy in that scene, uh, to run away with him to be his conscience because he needs her. Her answer is the best line. I hope I'm not stealing this from you, Chris. The best line of the episode, she said, I already have a job as counselor. Excellent line. Um, I offer this wisdom for my six decades on this planet. For anyone pondering a relationship, get into one that brings mutual benefit, not one where your value is serving someone else's needs or be ready to have it fail. The only relationship I've ever known uh, that works in a one-sided manner of uh, providing for the other person is parent to child. And I've come to know that even that one flips when you become their caregiver. So choose wisely and make sure the benefits are mutual. The rest are left unsaid time. Ain't that the truth. Thanks very much, my live in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Carrie Schwent is here. She's got some, uh, those of you that are just listening, mm -hmm. you're missing out. She's got some cats behind her stretching in the Troy and Crusher leotards. What's up, Carrie? What do you think of this one? Oh, I have I have thoughts and I they're sort of along the lines of 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 my I used to like this episode, but I found watching it this time very painful. My first marriage was an emotionally abusive one. So watching him manipulate her very difficult. Sorry. Thought I was going to be able to get through this without losing it, but yeah. Going, yeah, being on being on the Troy side of that is difficult. You find yourself underwater so easily, and in my case, so gradually. I didn't realize it for a very, very long time, but thank, it took me five Five years to finally get out of it. Thankfully, she only had to deal with this, you know, part of my French ass hat for just a couple of days, th th thankfully. But I'm glad she had um, Beverly, Beverly, to, Beverly to talk to. I think talking to her helped her, her realize it a little bit, being away, away, away from him to, to finally, to finally talk about it. And Anybody, I will probably never watch this episode again, fr frankly, because it's just it was too difficult to even take no take notes for it. 
after watching it the first the first time. And I thought about skipping the free for all, but I decided to to do it for anybody who's either watching or listening who is in a situation like this. Find somebody to talk to if you've survived a situation like like this or like mine. Thankfully, mine didn't get much beyond the emotional. Find yeah, find somebody to talking about it after the fact. I got lucky the second time around. I found someone who treats me the way Riker treats her, and he was he should have punched his lights out. Frankly, when he was bragging that he was with Troy. But he he kept it, he kept his cool and all he wanted for her was that that she that that she was happy even if it wasn't with him. Lightening up a bit, and now that I'm cal calmer again, the brightest spot for me was that scene at the beginning where sh she's having her verbal fisticuffs with the replicator who's in, you know. Nutritionally shaming her for wanting a real chocolate sundae. Just absolutely made me smile. So that's why I picked my got chocolate t-shirt to try to bring a little bit, a little bit of smile. And so I decided that my limerick today, because the other thing was way too painful to try to create a limerick for, my limerick is an ode to chocolate. So I will finish with that. Chocolate is a wondrous creation. Consuming it is like a vacation. Be it dark or creamy, every kind is so dreamy. It makes better any situation. Cheers. I think we can all agree to the chocolate thing. That's for sure. Yeah. I like the cheers <laughs> at the end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Allison Leach Hyde is here. No stranger to chocolate herself. I'll just bet like the rest of us. What'd you think of this one? I, I'm going to be on the bandwagon of uh, not my favorite episode ever. Um, There's some high points. I love the Ferengis in this episode. <laughs> they are so much fun. Um, Especially the whole bit about the chairs like that was the most important thing to Damon. like he's like i need my chair where are my chairs klingon oh, servants God. give me my chair like <laughs> like he would eat you alive why would you say that to her <laughs> so, i love that and their faces when the wormhole disappears on the ferengis that's the best part for me and my favorite line is let me see. It's in my notes. <gasps> there is a bright side, Jordy. You will have me to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Some data. I don't know if Jordy was super excited about it, but he would still be there. So, <laughs> And I thought the Caledonian's makeup was wonderful. I mean, just the big headpiece with the whole, and the actor is very tall, too. Oh, it's just striking and so much fun to see. And let's see one more thing. I loved Troy's royal blue dress. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I would so wear that right now. Mm -hmm. Me too. Let's cosplay. Twinsies. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> Much better. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Allison. Actually, those were the my two biggest laughs too. And we didn't even discuss it at all in the in the review. Was the the whole chair debacle was hilarious. Oh. And I went back and replayed the the Ferengi's reaction to the wormhole moving like three times. <laughs> they were they were <laughs> so good. Uh, all right, thanks very much. Glenn Iverson is here all the way from the Las Vegas sector. Glenn, welcome. What do you think of this one? Um, not my favorite, but it wasn't as bad as uh, some other people think it is. <laughs> um. I all the plot points and other things that I was going to cover have been checked off by everybody else, and I'm going to have to go unmute for a moment. Okay, he's, Glenn's <laughs> calling in from work, so he's in and out real quick. Uh, thanks very much, Glenn. I'm sure we'll see him back in a moment. Tierney C. Diekman is here, not calling in from work. What do you think of this one? Um, I'm 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 like still tearing up a little bit from Carrie, so pardon me and my sniffling. Um. We got you and uh i love i mean actually 
I, I, I am looking at my notes right now and like mentally crossing things off because I'm loving that I'm hearing a bunch of the same ones from multiple people. It always makes me happy when we have things that we agree on, especially the fun, positive things, um, particularly being the some of the great lines that we got uh, through this from the from the Frankie and their facial expressions and Picard's, you know, and you can have my chair because um, just wanted <laughs> to get the hell out of there. And uh, and definitely with uh, introducing the Barzans and that actor was perfect to portray him with his makeup and his costume. He's beautiful. And uh, was it uh, Bhavani? Is that her name? The uh, other negotiator and some really interesting uh, new species that we brought in uh, as well as, yeah, that <laughs> that line that Data says on the bright side. Uh, it's I, I'm pretty sure my husband has said like those exact lines of just and not understanding that this is not a bright side. You, you don't get this, dear God, um, and and other positives. But overall, putting putting aside the extremely uncomfortable creep factor and looking at it again, because like Jason, I wasn't really looking forward to watching this one again. Uh, this would definitely probably be a skip, regardless of the leotard stretching. Um, but rewatching it, kind of setting some things aside, I found that I actually enjoyed just about every aspect of this to to a point it's a little formulaic uh some you can you can see the plot twist coming but uh you know like the previous episode it did make me want to restart ds9 again i i liked the uh, uh the windows 93 version of the wormhole um but i wanted to see more of the diplomatic negotiations i wanted to know more about uh the the aliens they introduced in their cultures um there's some really nice strong moments from from the main cast here and those that they brought in. There's a lot of good subtleties, a lot of nice costuming, and there's there's a lot to say about Marina's performance too. But overall, with everything that was that I did like in rewatching it, what I didn't like, what I what I really could have done without was Matt McCoy's performance. And it's nothing against him as an actor. I don't dislike him. And I, I can almost see why they chose him. Maybe something because he had kind of a similar striking color to Riker, just built like Umby. But he was a weird choice for that role, for this, for this romance for Troy that wasn't Riker, and for these things. In if you if you're thinking of how the script must have been, these powerful moments that he's confessing to her, his his deep dark strength that no you would not let anybody know that you had this and that he wants to run away with her and that yes there's that super creepy scene that comes off as creepy and cringy because it does not play from his character very well um you'd think that there would be a deeper connection and it just comes off as hollow i'm Devanani Rao. like it just doesn't work from him it, uh, he's supposed to be charismatic it, it just maybe it's just me personally it might be a personal preference no dude you're cringy like he might be very smart but i don't get it i don't get it for her i don't get it for anything and then he you know touts this whole thing in front of Riker. she's not a prize and uh, she's not a trophy to be won and uh, it, it just that's what it is it's him he to me his performance just in this, his casting choice was wrong and it brings down what otherwise even formulaic could have been a much better episode with much deeper implications for this series as a whole of what could be done with negotiations and the Frankie and people getting stuck in the wormhole and lots of other little things that are very easy to miss because he, uh, she, he and their relationship are the main focus. So uh, more to be said, but yeah. Not not as bad as I remember, though. So. so some good and some bad there. Thanks very much, Tierney C. Diekman. <clears throat> Justin Weir, a.k.a. Shag840. What's up? What'd you think of this one? What's up? Um, I don't have too much to add because you guys have pretty much said it all. Um, Melissa, it, it, this is a mixed bag for sure. You, that sums it up perfectly. Um, because I did enjoy it, but I agree with everyone else. I did not look forward to rewatching this episode. Uh, Tierney, what was the actor's name? You said it. Uh, Matt McCoy. 
Matt McCoy. The, the Se- Seinfeld God. gum guy. Yeah, I feel bad because I only know him from Seinfeld and TNG, and I hate his character in both. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see. He's <laughs> creepy. But you're supposed to hate him in Seinfeld, not in this. Yeah. I, I mean, thanks for the tips of how to uh, pick up a woman on the Enterprise. You just, like, it was just, like, hours, and he's stroking her hair. Like, how does that work? <laughs> I don't understand. Um, I do like. I, I've noticed in other episodes I didn't bring it up, but they uh, they keep bringing up poker even when they're not playing it. Poker has become a theme of this show, which is pretty cool. Um, I brought it up last week. We saw Riker take a little shot. We see him take another shot in this episode. Um, no one mentioned this, so I will add that I do like that we do find out what happens to the two Ferengi that got lost on the other side of the wormhole in Voyager. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that's all I got. <laughs> Creepy episode. It definitely is. Great point about <laughs> that. I'd forgotten about that. Uh, but I did wonder, I was like, wait, is that the two Ferengi from... Wow, that's uh, good stuff there, Justin. Thanks very much. Chris McGee is here. What's up, Chris? What'd you think of this one? Uh-oh, we can't hear you. Because I forgot to mute, unmute myself. Uh, I pretty much agree with most of everyone here, um, especially uh, Jason. Yeah, it's probably my least favorite episode, or certainly within the bottom 10 anyway. I mean, I do love that this season uh, has more episodes that are centered around the characters, each, per, each single person to explore their character and personality. That's awesome. This one, of course, centers around Troy, but for some reason, I just don't really like the episode. I, I think it's because I find Raw to be slimy, even without the oil. Um, it, it, I've seen the actor who plays a Matt McCoy in many things, and in most of those, he plays a prick. So if that's with, with the uh, result they were hoping for in this episode, they nailed it and perfectly cast him. Uh, of course, I think his biggest flaw is how cocky he is, particularly when he defends his use of his empathic powers to Deanna by telling her, well, I gained an advantage by using it with you. You didn't seem to mind that kind of surprised. She didn't deck him after that. Um, but overall, I, I think the story is good, especially having seen it with, you know, adult eyes now. Uh, but I still feel like Troy, as, as Tierney and Justin mentioned, Troy fell for Raul's charm far too quickly. Uh, so I, uh, I think that the only two good things to come out of this episode are, as just mentioned, the semi follow up episode in Star Trek Voyager. And of course, the memes that have resulted from that stretching scene. As for the memorable quote of the episode, say with me, you're unusually limber this morning. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Thanks very much, Chris McGee, Dark Lord. Uh, oh, Glenn Iverson, did you have something you wanted to add before we uh, jump off here? Because you had to hop off for a second. Um, yes, if I could remember my train of thought that got derailed in Paducah. My, uh, I, I agree with pretty much everything everybody said. Um, it was a great episode in spite of the creepiness. And I actually think, um, as I believe Chris already said, that Matt McCoy was perfectly cast as that character because he brought a perfect creepiness factor, which is apparently what they wanted. And I also want to bring up something else that nobody else did, and that's that Kevin Peter Hall was one of the guest stars as Leor. And he's actually, if I remember correctly, the tallest guest star ever in Star Trek at almost seven foot three. Oh, wow. interesting, because we've had a lot of tall ones. Good stuff. Yeah, he's that's... a couple inches t- taller than Carol Striken. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Jeez. Great stuff. Thanks very much. Glenn Iverson out in the Las Vegas sector. All right. That's it for us today, everybody. But thanks for hanging out with us. It was a lot of fun. Make sure you uh, like this video, subscribe to the channel. Give us a five-star rating if you're listening in and a nice review. We'd really appreciate that. And hey, thanks to Melissa, Jason, Glenn, Allison, Carrie, Mai, Tierney, Justin, and Chris for hanging out with us. Uh, that's it for us, for Sirach Lofton, myself, Melissa Longo, Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you for hanging out. We'll see you next time. And until then, always remember, 
the seventh rule.